Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is the Gospel just read, and we will also be looking at the words from Philippians chapter 4. Let's hear again those words from Philippians 4. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Always. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Really, Paul? Really? Always is a big word. You are calling me to rejoice. I am in prison, waiting to have my head chopped off for speaking the truth to King Herod? Rejoice always. Really? Paul, I think you've lost it. <coughs> always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Really, Paul? Always is such a big word. You are calling me to rejoice when my child has just been killed in Newtown, Connecticut. Rejoice? Paul, I think you lost it. Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Really, Paul? Always is such a big word. You are calling me to rejoice with so much death around us, so much heartache and fear, physical cliffs, frightened children. There are more problems in this world now than there ever were. Paul, I think you've lost it. You have to admit that Paul's words seem a little delusional. Sometimes. I think maybe this is why I like John the Baptist better than St. Paul. <laughs> John asks Jesus the question, Are you the coming one, or should we look for another? That's John's question. John sends the question to Jesus through his disciples. John, who is currently stuck in prison, awaiting his execution because he spoke the truth to King Herod. Telling the truth to powerful people is dangerous business, especially if the truth isn't something they want to hear. John, you remember, is Jesus' cousin. He has gone into the wilderness to preach the gospel. His whole life has been spent leading up to Jesus' day. He baptized Jesus. And Jesus has begun his ministry of proclaiming release and forgiveness to a lost and dying world. John was the one, when he saw our Lord, John was the one who pointed to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. And at this stage in Jesus' ministry, by all accounts, things are going well. Jesus has forgiven sins, he has cast out of demons, he has healed the sick, he has even raised the dead. All in all, things are looking up for our Lord. There's one thing he hasn't done. He hasn't released John from prison. So there's John, forerunner, the greatest of those born among women, Jesus said. Surely, he deserves to be at Jesus' side, ruling alongside our Lord when he comes into his kingdom. But no, he is stuck in prison, wondering if this whole Messiah thing is really that great of an idea. 
I don't think we can blame John a whole lot for this question. Are you the coming one, or should we look for another? John, I think, might have asked that same question to Paul. Really, Paul? Always? Christianity, as much as anything else, is all about waiting. Faith is anticipation. Faith is looking to what we cannot see. Faith is recognizing that things don't make sense. They don't fit together. They don't all hang the way that we think that they should. And faith is recognizing that God will carry us through the end, even when, especially when, they don't make sense. It's impossible to think about John waiting in prison to die this week without thinking of the parents of those poor children who were murdered in Newtown, Connecticut. What are those parents thinking about right now as they look to Christmas? I'm sure you've thought that question just as I have. One of those little girls was a member of the Missouri Synod congregation, a new member they joined about two months before. So if you put yourself in the position of those parents, we have to admit it is hard to recognize the good in the world. That's John the Baptist right there. That is John saying to Jesus, Lord, I know your promises. I've read my Bible. I've preached that promise. But get on with it, for heaven's sake. We're dying here, left and right. We're broken, John says. We need you. <clears throat> John is you and I here. But the truth is, so is St. Paul. Remember that when Paul said those delusional words, rejoice in the Lord always, Paul was in prison too, in Rome. He was waiting to see if his head would be chopped off like John the Baptist was. So when Paul writes these words, he is not saying this as a Pollyanna. He's not just being the eternal optimist, always finding good, even when there isn't any good to be found. No, Paul is not saying, be happy. He's saying, rejoice, which is a very different. Rejoice, he says, in the midst of hardships. Rejoice in the midst of trials. Rejoice, yes, even in the midst of death itself. How can this be? How can there be true joy in the midst of such things? Perhaps Zephaniah can help us from our Old Testament reading. The Lord your God, says Zephaniah, the Lord your God is in your midst mighty one who will say, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Rejoicing. Both here, for John the Baptist, for St. Paul, and for you and I, rejoicing doesn't mean being happy. It means recognizing that what you see and experience now isn't the whole story say that again, because it's important. Rejoicing means recognizing that what you see and experience now isn't the whole story. Only God has the whole story. What's more, the story doesn't end with John's head, or St. Paul's, or the little ones who died in Bethlehem, or the little ones and their teachers who died in Newtown, or anywhere else. The story doesn't end with death at all, or sorrow, or suffering, or hardship, or heartache. The story, beloved, ends with resurrection. Resurrection, you say? That's an Easter word. You can't use that in Advent. Well, we can, and we will. Advent is about our Lord's coming, after all. It's about his coming in lowliness as a little child, 
It's about his coming hidden under word and meal, water and forgiveness. And Advent is about his coming in glory on the last day to raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. That means he will raise John the Baptist with his head and St. Paul and the little ones in Bethlehem and in Newtown, your loved ones and mine. And that means he will raise me and you. And on that day, there will be no more sorrow, no more tears. There will only be a joy completed, fulfilled by communion with him forever. It is no accident that St. Paul says we are to lay our requests before our Lord with thanksgiving. That's the word Eucharist, friends. That's the Lord's Supper. For wherever the Eucharist, that great thanksgiving is, there we have a glimpse of of angels and archangels, sinners and saints, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Today we receive a foretaste of the great rejoicing to come. But until that day of ultimate joy, dearly baptized, until that day, we rejoice in the Lord always. We do this because He rejoices over you. He will quiet you with His love. We rejoice today because God holds all things in his hands. Even St. John the Baptist, even St. Paul, even the little ones in Bethlehem, even the little ones and their teachers in Newtown, even you, even me. Beloved, being in that hand, being in that hand is a very good place to be. Leave it for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith to life everlasting. Amen. Amen.